In 1958, East Germany shocked the world with the rollout of its jet-powered aircraft, the Bade 152. Seemingly, this new nation had in only a few short years accomplished what took decades elsewhere and brought the jet revolution to the Soviet Union even before Moscow. But politics would be its undoing, and East Germany's first and only jet passenger aircraft would never see scheduled service, despite being in full production. What was the Bade 152? Where would it be like to fly? And why was it never built? Let's jump in! Converting a military bomber aircraft to a passenger jet plane was not a new idea, and it was the start of what would become the Bade 152. Its design could seat up to 57 passengers, or 72 in a high-density configuration, and it would be used throughout the Soviet Union, and even marketed to the West using American-made avionics. If it had gone ahead, it would have been a political triumph of the USSR and cement the East German aviation industry for decades to come. But it never happened, and to understand, we need to go back to the very beginning. The 1950s was a very different place in Europe. Germany was occupied by the two sides of the Cold War, with the West controlling the west side of the country, and East Germany under the USSR's controlling influence. As part of its stewardship of the country, the USSR had eliminated the homegrown aviation industry after the war, and deported all of the aerospace engineers to work on military projects in Moscow. The country was left without any involvement in aviation, and lacked a competitive edge of the world stage. But these engineers had not been idle in Moscow. Whilst working in the USSR, they noticed that the Soviet bomber project, the OKB-150, could very well be used as a commercial passenger jet aircraft. By the early 50s, East Germany had officially been founded and the German aerospace scientists allowed to return home. Many of which couldn't shake the idea of the jet bomber turned civil aircraft. At the same time, the new state of East Germany declared that it needed a new aerospace company, called the VEB Wurzewerger, based in the city of Dresden. It was initially set to build military aircraft, but thanks to a popular uprising in the USSR the very next year, the powers that be deemed it to be a civil production facility only. It was initially licensed to build Soviet-era piston planes, but the company had more grander ideas. To jumpstart product development, the firm hired the newly returned engineers like Brunoff Bade, among others, and got the whole team to start work on a new design. As the whole team had worked on that Soviet bomber, and still very well had the idea to turn into a civil jet plane, the firm decided to commit to the idea, dubbing it the Bade 152 after the lead engineer. The production facility would be set up to produce 18 airframes within the decade, and jumpstart the East German aviation industry, essentially leapfrogging over their proposed rivals in the western state. But what was the Bade 152 actually like? As mentioned before, the Bade 152 was configured with 57 seats in a one-cabin configuration of around 34 inches of legroom, although during the proposed stage, several other alternative seating arrangements were created, such as a 72-passenger configuration or a more spacious 42-seater for leisure routes. Likely, the firm also considered a VIP transport option for around 10 passengers. As the plane was based on the previous bomber, it would share many of the same aerodynamics, including a range of 2,000 to 2,500 kilometers, depending on the seating configuration. Arguably, this range is very low and would have led to poor market reach many years later, but for the time, it actually fit the bill. 
To power the aircraft, the firm went with the Prina 014 turbojet from local Berlin engine manufacturers, with two turbojets on each wing, housed together in one engine casing. The plane would also have up to six crew members to fly it, including three cabin crew and three in the cockpit. In terms of routes, the design team proposed that it would fly throughout the Soviet Union as a small shuttle aircraft to link nearby cities, owing to its small range, much like the role proposed by the French manufacturer Sud Aviation. Local airline Lufthansa, not the same one that we have today, jumped at the chance to buy the home state aircraft with an order for 20 planes. Production of the first prototype was slow, as facilities in East Germany were lacking compared to the Western counterparts, and several avionics were unavailable in the USSR that were needed for a modern jet aircraft. Because of this, the firm reached out to several Western and American aerospace firms for components and suggested that if some sales could be gained from Western Airlines, then production could become a joint venture. By 1958, the first prototype rolled out of the workshop on a very unique looking tandem landing gear and glazed nose for a navigator to look out. Common feature amongst Soviet era strategic bombers, but never really seen before on a passenger jet aircraft. The maiden flight was a success, and it looked like as if the East German state had freed itself from the shackles of being behind the West. Unfortunately, only a few months later, that dream would end forever. On the 4th of March 1959, the prototype crashed during its second test flight and killed all on board. Being a political embarrassment, the crash was never fully investigated and hidden well until after the change in government in 1990. It has since been believed that the aircraft had a fatal flaw with its design. When in a steep descent, such as coming into land on a short runway, the fuel tanks got cut off and the engines stalled, leading to a crash. Additionally, it is also believed that a lack of experience with stalling engines led the test pilots to underestimate recovery times and be unable to get out of the stall before the crash. Following the accident, the firm switched to the second prototype to test the Berlin-produced Prina 014 jet engines. The design would also do away with the glazed nose and strange landing gear, bringing the design in line with other jet aircraft used at the time. A third prototype was also designed, but it never made it to flight testing and was only used for cabin and control service tests. After three flight tests, the entire program was grounded. The fatal flaw that had led to the first crash had seemed insolvable, without a total redesign and scrapping of the 20 aircraft in production for Lufthansa. But this wasn't the reported reason for the cancellation of the program. Rather, it was political. The Soviet Union in Moscow, who had initially promised that the Bade 152 would fly throughout the USSR, actually stepped in and commanded the East German state to dissolve the entire aerospace industry, shutting down all production and scrapping the design, including the two prototypes. This was because the USSR was working on its own airframe to compete in the same market, the Tupolev Tu-124 while Russia's twin-jet Tupolev airliner was a center of attention. As such, they dropped the pretense of supporting the program, cut off the funding, and refused to follow through with any orders. And with a plane that couldn't fly, a production that had no orders of funding, and a market that was quickly evolving with the arrival of the Boeing 707, it looks like the Iron Curtain would close on the Bade 152 for the final time. Looking back at this era, we can see that the development team was ahead of their time. The Bade 152 was based on designs from the war, a scrapped bomber from the USSR, and a dream from East Germany aerospace engineers who wanted to change the way their country was seen on the world stage.
Had the program been successful, we'd have likely seen the equivalent of a third player on the market against Boeing and Airbus. This is because the firm was sheltered away from the West in the USSR, and with state support, they would have been able to tap almost in an exclusive market. And as it wasn't a state controlled and rather an East Germany than Russia, it would have been able to find its own way after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But that's an alternative history that we will never see. Ironically, the Bade 152 firm would go on to become an Airbus maintenance facility for the Airbus A310 in 1990, and go on to become a world-renowned facility converting Airbus aircraft into freighters, and be one of the only MRO maintenance facilities that can provide an overhaul of an entire Airbus A380 in the world. A happy ending, although in a roundabout way. What do you think? Is the Bade 152 a good concept, or does it deserve to just stay in the history books? Let us know down in the comments. And this video today was actually provided by one of our subscribers. So if you're a subscriber and you have an idea for a video, let me know down in the comments and I'll check it out. And who knows, you could very well be next featured on Found and Explained. And if you're looking for more content just like this, or you want to see behind the scenes, then I'm proud to say that we have a new website at foundandexplained.com. Come check it out and do a quiz based off this video. See how much of an expert you are and see more content just like this. And if you want to support the channel, then we have a fantastic Patreon community with a link down below that you can check out. It has live streams, tutorials, and you can vote on the new topics coming out soon. This is Nick from Found and Explained. Thank you so much for watching.